Greetings, I'm Ken Weinstein, the Walter P. Stern Distinguished Fellow here at Hudson Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this big book forum for Elbridge Colby's The Strategy of Denial, American Defense in an Era of Great Competition, Great Power Competition, just published by Yale University Press. Bridge Colby, of course, has held numerous posts of distinction, most notably as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy and Force Development in the Trump administration, in which he was the key architect of the 2018 US defense strategy, the most widely heralded uh, defense strategy in a generation, marking a landmark DOD strategy shift to the challenges posed by a rising China and a revisionist Russia. Bridge is an old friend who has produced a truly remarkable book, rare for a book on US defense strategy. It's written in a compelling argumentative manner, almost in the style of a work of analytic philosophy, uh, infinitely more engaging, honestly, than most of the analytic philosophy I've had the misfortune of reading over the years. He builds his arguments step by step, makes his premises abundantly clear, handles complex matters of strategy and warfare, really matters of life and death, ranging from the role of the human psyche to energy security to tactical nuclear weapons, replete with references to history and literature, with a seriousness that fits the subject matter and a parsimony that should be the envy of any author, let alone any strategist. On what he argues should be the key focus of US defense strategy, which is of course the China challenge. The result is a must read book, not one you will necessarily agree with on every turn of argument, but one that future strategists in the United States and the rest of the world will need to grapple with for some time to come. To grapple with this volume and to focus on its strengths, which I think are quite apparent, uh, as well as questions uh, that arise, we have two distinguished Hudson Institute colleagues with us today, Senior Fellow and Director of China Strategy, Michael Pillsbury, the man who cracked the code on China, as it were, uh, in his remarkable best-selling must-read that fundamentally changed the debate over China here in Washington and around the world, the 100-year marathon, China's secret strategy to replace the United States as the global superpower, and senior fellow Nadia Shadlow, uh, the principal author of another must-read in her role as the former Deputy National Security Advisor, the path-breaking 2017 National Security Strategy, which reshaped national security strategy for the hour of for the era of great competition, great power competition, incidentally, for which Bridge Colby was the principal Department of Defense interlocutor to the White House. I'm going to open up the discussion by asking Bridge a few questions about his book before asking Nadia and then Mike to offer their perspectives on the strategy of denial. So, welcome everyone and welcome uh, Bridge. And let me start, Bridge, with the beginning. Why did you decide to write this book? Well, first off, Ken, thank you. I'm, I'm genuinely honored and, and actually and, and touched by your, your comments. They, they mean a great deal. And I know you're, you're uh, in addition to your long leadership at Hudson and your, uh, your, your experience in Japan and around the world, but also your liberal education uh, in, in political theory. So um, we could spend the time talking about Thumos, but maybe we won't, we won't go down that, that too, too far. And, and then, you know, two great friends, Nadia, my, my, my the close collaborator and in her leadership role in the national security strategy and Mike Pillsbury and his giant influence on the China debate. So it's, it's really a, a wonderful honor to be here and, and thank you for taking the time to engage with the book. Why did I write it? Uh, it did kind of come out of my Pentagon experience. It's not a, it's not a tell all of uh, you know, sort of boring bureaucratic stories, but in the sense, what I really, really was imprinted on me was the need for strategy in a particular sense. And I think in the book, you may recall, you know, I think of strategy not as a kind of a clever plan or sort of master plan, but actually is more of a strategic framework that a situation that, that a, a framework you use in a condition of scarcity, you know, in the way the economists use it to make optimizing choices when, you know, the world, of course, is complex. One of the things I can't stand is how strategy always talking about the world is complex. Well, yeah, of course. Right. The question is, how do you make good decisions in that complexity? And I saw, so I, you know, and, and coming in the Pentagon, you'd, you'd see the kinds of decisions that people had to make about forces, about resources, deployments, et cetera. And you could see just the kind of inertia and confusion that would result in the sort of status quo uh, sort of preferences that would result from this kind of confusion and, and mud, muddiness. And I thought to myself, somebody really should, you know, bang their head against the wall and try to have a framework that will 
make those debates, I think, more focused and productive. And I think, you know, I, 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 you know, what you suggested, Ken, is exactly the spirit that I hope people take it. I don't pretend that every answer in this book is, is the final one or that I'm the expert on all of these particular issues. But what I do hope is that it provides a framework where we can be focused on the key issue and think about the choices in a sort of rational, deductive way and be, and, and be conscious of the, of the trade-offs because even a thing as sensitive to Taiwan is not a, a cut and dried issue. Uh, it's, it's, it's a question of cost, risk and, and cost and benefit. So, so that's why I wrote it. And what I hope is that the policy community, the defense establishment, our partners, you know, allies and partners in their defense and security establishment, foreign policy, and frankly, American, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a Republican, I'm a smaller Republican too. I, I want our, I believe our citizenry needs to be engaged and we're going back into an era in which you can imagine a major war of, of potentially of apocalyptic proportions, but certainly of great war proportions. And I think people need to understand the choices that we're making ahead of time, ideally so we can deter it and if necessary, win in it. So, so I, I, I hope it, it appeals to a broad audience, but of course the main thing is to help the country make better decisions in the defense and national security arena. Let, let me ask you, since you wrote the book after obviously playing this key role in the uh, 20, 18 national defense strategy. Do you feel that this completes your work, not or at least furthers the effort that you made? I mean, what, 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 what were, if you had to redo the national defense strategy, yeah. then what would you do? Well, it would, it's a good question. I, I try not to think about it too much because, uh, uh, you know, if I thought about it too much, I might have not have had the foolishness to continue working on the book. You know, it's sort of like something you sort of you do before, don't overthink it because otherwise you might stop. Uh, but, but I think actually the national defense strategy came out pretty much where we wanted, but I think what, one of the real reasons is that I felt that it lacked a, an, or it didn't lack, but it's a bureaucratic document. It, it, it told the department what to focus on, but, you know, for instance, in the way it talks about regional, favorable regional balances of power, or it talks about, you know, theories of victory. These are terms that are suggestive but not precise. And, and I think we're at a point where the delicacy of the strategic balance with China and in terms of the other potential threats we face is so challenging that we need real clarity. And, and, and I was just struck by, I think, I think someone would be able to take that strategy and I hope they continue it basically. It would be much more productive in the debates about it would be much more productive if, if it were situated within this broader context. So just to take one example, I was regularly banging my head against the wall in the Pentagon running into the problem of people saying, well, Bridge, why are you so focused on China and so forth? That, that's not what, what's likely to happen. And so I thought to myself, well, somebody needs to sit down and explain why you should focus on the best strategy, not the likeliest strategy. And, you know, I, I ended up accusing myself, right? But, but I mean, I think that's the sort of thing that this hopefully, you know, will, will provide an intellectual framework where we can have those debates. And then bureaucratic documents, as Nadia knows better than I, you know, those you operate, you know, first of all, there's you know, you, there's never one person with the pen. It's never exactly what you want. It's always a point in time. This, I hope, to be kind of be a framework within those discussions can happen. Very interesting. And you, you talked about, uh, in, in particular, about public opinion and 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 the critical role of public opinion. And and and, uh, and, and you and you and you and you read the book. And I think we should turn to the argument in a second. But when you, you when I, when I read the book, one of the things that struck me, and it, it, when you talk about cornerstone balancing, anti-hegemonic coalitions. There's, there is kind of a distance from the way that the public perceives uh, both the United States' role in global affairs, you know, and, and the kind of rhetoric you need to marshal broader public support. I'm wondering how you think about it, that in producing a book, and then let's turn to the argument. Yeah, well, so um, it's interesting. I, I thought about that a little bit. I mean, what I was really trying to crack the nut on here is just like the tightest, most parsimonious argument that, I mean, in a sense, I use the term elite here, not in a good way or a bad way, frankly, but just, I mean, I think if we have it straight in our head for the people who work on this professionally or are willing to dedicate, you know, significant amounts of time and, and, and that, you know, we can get that straight, then there's a way to talk about these concepts. I, I don't think I'm necessarily the best person to do that, but, but people who speak more broadly, politicians, for instance, opinion columnists, these sorts of things, they, they, they will have a better tactile sense. I don't know what that is. On the other hand, I think back, you know, and I mean, you, you would know this better as well as I, you know, whatever than I, but I mean, I think presidents and, and, and political leaders in the past and, and columnists, you know, Walter Lippmann or Franklin Roosevelt have been able to communicate these kinds of basic concepts or, or connect them in ways that the American people will, 
then will resonate with the American people. So I don't think it's, I don't think my book does that necessarily. Um, and a lot of the terms are clunky, like the external cornerstone balancer or anti-hegemonic coalition or differentiated credibility. But I just want, I want it to be as precise and clear as possible. And then from that point, I think we can, we can, or, or I or others who agree with me can, can, can work that out from a rhetorical point of view. But I think it's critical that we be orienting from and grounded from clarity. No, that, that's very helpful. Uh, it, it, I think it's very helpful in terms of putting the book in, in a broader perspective because the, you know, the, the parsimony is, is, is remarkable and uh, uh, it, it's, it's, an, it's an incredible achievement uh, and in, in the distance, but the distance from public opinion is also something that needs to be bridged, pardon the <laughs> use of your... Well, let, let, let's, let's go through the argument of it. Just talk about uh, the, you know, where you, what, the dimensions of the China challenge and how, how we best meet it. Sure. I mean, I think denial refers to sort of a two, a two level idea. The, the first is that our, you know, try to think very clearly and kind of, as you suggest, parsimoniously kind of strip away all the excess uh, or, 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 or surplus, if you will, uh, of what it is that we want to do in the world. And I orient from I would say an enlightened, but a self-interested view of the American, you know, this, the interests of the American citizenry, right? I mean, their, their security, of course, but also their freedom and their prosperity. And from that, I say, well, we don't want to be in a position where some entity was so powerful, large enough to coerce us over things we really care about. And the only way I can see that happening is if some state, because no state is individually large enough to do that to us, if some state could agglomerate the power of a bunch of other states and turn that towards us. And I mean, I think you, you know, obviously China is the largest other state in the international system and the, the largest market area in the world is Asia, which is, of course, where China is located. So it's kind of that becomes the priority area. And I think this is an, this is a, a, an argument that is, is, is inchoate in the book. And I, and I actually want to develop further. It's not as military oriented, but it's, is what is that? What are those stakes that we're talking about? What, are, what is that future? And I, you know, the reality is I think we're, we're sort of under intellectualized relative to re reality. I mean, the Chinese, like day by day, they demonstrate how they're going to use a dom how they would use a dominant geoeconomic position to intervene in other countries. I mean, today it was Lithuania, you know, the other day it was Australia, you know, the NBA, Disney, et cetera. So I, that's what I want to think about, but I think that's the future we have to fear. And actually I do think that's one that is pretty deeply rooted in, and I was kind of trying to sort of subtly make an argument against, say, I mean, take a Robert Kagan argument. There's a fundamental caesura in American history between the sort of isolationist past and the more act. And I mean, obviously, there was a change around World War II, but I actually see it as more, there's more continuity because, you know, I mean, you're a, a giant expert on Japan, for instance. You know, there were, um, the American military was used to open Japan in the 1850s because we didn't want to be excluded from trade from Asia, one of the key market areas. So there's a remarkable amount of consistency. So what we want to avoid is a situation in which say half of global GDP was being used to coerce us. And I think that's very real. I mean, to give a concrete example, you know, Facebook was on the, on the hot seat yesterday in the Congress. The whole premise of that idea is that we as Americans and as um, the American polity has the power to force Facebook, the dominant social media or Twitter or, or whatever to change its behavior. But of course, if that's all oriented around China, which I think, you know, to Mike's point, that is kind of the plan, uh, then we're not going to be able to do that. We're going to have to go supplicate to Beijing. So we want to deny that and, and deny China that power. The problem is that China is, you know, thinking about China's best strategy deductively, China knows that, you know, it knows that our best strategy is to assemble and sustain a, a sufficiently cohesive anti-hegemonic coalition, you know, basically a group of states that don't want to live under China's thumb. Uh, and actually, we're making pretty good progress towards that over the last five years or so in the Quad and so forth, AUKUS. Um, so China's best strategy, I think, is to pry, so pry it apart, short circuit it. China wants to avoid precipitating a large scale conflict or confrontation with an assembled coalition. Think Hitler, 1942, right? Um, or Japan, 1942. Instead, pursue some what I call the focused and sequential strategy, basically zero in on a couple of vulnerable parts of this coalition that are connected to America's differentiated credibility, which is the steel in the spine of that coalition. Zap them, make an example, and you cause a run on the bank, basically. People stop thinking it's worthwhile, and they decide it's more prudent to cut a deal with Beijing. Think about Rodrigo Duterte. He's kind of more overt, but obviously that's going through the heads of lots of people in Asia uh, and around the world. Okay, so if we want to avoid that, 
The problem is that China is going to have an incentive to use its military to pursue that objective, because I think they're seeing that they're going to come up short on the reliance on like economic sanctions. I mean, look at Australia standing strong and so forth. But they have a military. They built a military not only to resolve the Taiwan issue, but to project power throughout the region. And we haven't been paying attention. We haven't been moving fast enough. Um, and so in that context, what do we need to do? Well, we're facing a superpower for the first time since the Soviet Union. We can't overdo it because this is this, you know, we're going to be un, under the nuclear shadow. And I think the basic idea is again denial. And, and it's a it's a negative political goal. Obviously, there can be more active and offensive military operational strategies, but the basic idea is fight, defend those exposed allies within the coalition well enough that they are able to hold on. So it's a contextual or relative standard. You know, if you're defending Finland, you know, redoubtable Finland or Vietnam, it might be rather than I use the example of like Belgium in 1940, which collapsed, right? But that gives us a sense, defeat the invasion, because at the end of the day, if China wants to subordinate Taiwan or let alone the Philippines or whatever and get them to fall in the line, I think it's going to have to use direct military force. If, if we can deny them that objective, we'll be in a pretty good place. We may want or need to do a bit more, but that'll give us a baseline. And then if we can do that, then we'll be in a decent place. The anti-hegemonic coalition will stand up and cohere. It'll be sufficiently protected and we'll have a favorable balance of power. And from that position, we can negotiate a decent peace, even with a communist China. You know, I, I would rather China be governed by a free society, but that's not our, it's not a core interest of ours. And the problem is that that standard, given how powerful China is, is so demanding that we're, I think, I'm increasingly the view that we're going to have to pretty much almost stop what we're doing everywhere else. And, you know, if we don't get, you know, I, it's kind of, it just really make sure we, we get this front, central front right uh, and then we can worry about other things, but but we're not where we need to be. And I'm I'm actually increasingly worried, uh, you know, year by year. Sorry to go on, but yeah. No, no, no. Let me, let me pick up a couple of themes, and I'll turn it over to uh, Nadia for comments. Uh, yeah, one is on the Taiwan scenario and the scenario you raised of the outright invasion. Is that the most likely scenario? There, there's the gray zone operation, which is much harder to defend against, which. Uh, than, an, than an outright invasion, and that poses all sorts of uh, challenges for us that uh, we are not able to, to meet. Let me throw that in as the first question. Sure. I just don't think the gray zone thing will work for China. I mean, there's no way you're going to hoodwink the Taiwanese into giving up their autonomy. And I mean, especially after they've seen what happened in Hong Kong. And by definition, gray zone activities are below the threshold of war. You know, they're, they're insufficiently provocative or consequential to trigger military action. So, I mean, by definition, they're small ball. And I think that, you know, in fact, the, the winds are blowing against Beijing on Taiwan, let alone the region as a whole. So if Beijing is in earnest about it, which they appear to be at that point, you know, it, as Napoleon said, if you want to take Vienna, take Vienna. And I mean, the, the analogy I use here is, I mean, the, the Bush administration did not want to annex Iraq, but it could not, neither the Clinton nor the Bush administration could coerce Iraq over something it really cared about using bombing, sanctions, international program, et cetera. And it felt that it ultimately had to invade. And I think that's the level of thing that you're going to, um, that the Chinese are going to have to do. And the good news is that the gray zone is actually less of a problem than I think a lot of people appreciate. The bad news is it makes it more likely that I think China will in fact resort to direct military action. The second question is what you said about that we need to, and I'm paraphrasing essentially, uh, stop doing what we're doing elsewhere in order to focus on China, which, and you, you talk about it in the book, but the, the challenge of uh, China's uh, partners, I guess, taking action simultaneous while China does in Taiwan, you've got, you know, Russia could decide this is now the time to go into the Baltics. Right. Uh, you have Iran, which could decide that this is now the time to take, uh, to make use of its soon to be acquired nuclear weapons. And so, the question is, uh, how do you, you know, can the United States actually step back uh, in, in any deep way while not leaving us even more open to the, the China threat? Right. Well, I think there should and can. I mean, I think should, yes. Um, I mean, I would rather have a situation in which we didn't have to do this, but I think we've reached a point where I think it's really important that people reckon with the reality that we are on track to lose. I mean, that's what you know, essentially Davidson is saying, was saying when he was an OPECOM commander, the Taiwan defense minister basically signaling the same thing in the, in the immediate near term. 
And I'm on this one, I'm a Churchillian. Churchill said, if you get things, if we get things right in the decisive theater, we can put everything right again afterwards. I mean, if we if we prevail in the 50% global market arena, essentially what Europe used to be, but now Asia is the center of the, of the world in a sense, then we will be we will have a favorable basis to fix things elsewhere. If we if we lose there, we'll lose the decisive theater and, and our core interests will be subject to Chinese coercion, and we're likely to lose in the secondary theaters. So I don't think it's really. I mean, I don't think it's really, um, it, it seems clear to me what, what we need to do, that we need to take care. I mean, you know, the joke I have is sort of like, you know, we have heart disease, we have tennis elbow, and we have like shingles, you know, it's like, you got to take care of the heart disease, you know, and the other ones you, you mitigate against, but if you have limited time, that's what you address. You go to that doctor first. The other thing is, I think we do have a solution to it, which is, you know, people are always talking about our vaunted allies and partner network. And it's true, except it's totally latent thus far. I mean, we really are underperforming. And this is something we've really, I know you guys have been doing a ton of important work about, but how do we get people to step up? I mean, the Europeans are fully capable of defending, conventionally defending Europe against the Russians. They, they particularly the Germans, are not willing to step up, which I think is embarrassing and irresponsible of Germany. And but we need to find a way to have to move them on that. A lot of other European countries are doing it. Uh, similarly, in the Middle East, I think we've got the Abraham Accords and, and, and so forth to build on as, as a coalition to check, check Iran and so forth. So I'm not minimizing these problems as threats, but they are lesser threats uh, and, and ones I think we can mitigate. The other thing I would say is, you know, my, my, my good friend and my partner, Wes Mitchell, um, he's, by the way, he's got a great article in the National Interest out dealing with the simultaneity problem, which is a very real one. But he says, look, Bridge, the nature of the dismount is critical. And I think this is, an, in a way, a lot of where, uh, and, and, and Matt Pottinger has said things similarly, I don't know, not even said this to you, that in, in a way it's like Europe might be the more free fire, uh, not free fire, but kind of like the arena, because there's more range of futures. You know, there's kind of like a geometric quality, to, like Japan has no choice, they have to work with us. India has almost no choice, they have to work with us. But I think actually a lot of the most creative and important diplomacy is going to happen in Europe and the Middle East because we're not going to be able to flood the zone with, with our military resources. So we're going to have to have build coalitions this way. So I think this is one of the kind of conversations I want to help catalyze, but within the context of this overall prioritization and, and, and a consciousness of scarcity. And I, I'm still worried that people don't have this mindset, you know? And, you know, I, I mean, I really think we could be in the position that where we could lose in the primary theater, and that won't be the end of it, of course. Well, thank you, Bridge. I'm going to turn it over to Nadia now for her comments. Okay, uh, thanks so much, Ken and, and Bridge, and I look forward to hearing Michael's comments. So I'll start by recapping some of the main themes um, of the book that I found, you know, sort of my, my cliff notes for, for listeners. Um, first, it's an excellent book and a very important one. Uh, the fundamental idea that I took away, which I think is really important, is that this is not a book about global stability, right? We use these terms, these big overarching terms that don't really mean much actually. It's a book that really argues that you have to think about defense strategy in terms of regions and to understand that to achieve the political goals that a defense strategy should be about, you start with a great quote in your first chapter, we need to focus on regions. And you focus on four regions, um, uh, Asia, Europe, North America, and, um, What's the other one? Uh, Persian opposite Gulf. of Persian Gulf, Persian Gulf, right? You focus on four regions. And I think that that's really important. That is the big, big takeaway of the book. Second, as you eloquently point out, it's not just the United States that's responsible for keeping the balance in these regions, uh, but it's coalitions of allies and partners, and you call these anti-hegemonic uh, coalitions, right? Or if I were speaking to my high school daughter, I'd say coalitions of states that are working together to prevent the advance of a hegemon in a region, right? That's what your anti-hegemonic coalition means. Um, and you ask the key questions. Will these individual states bend or fight, right? Uh, how will they respond to the advance or, uh, of a hegemon like China? Um, can states defend themselves? You argue that they can, but with the US as being crucial, right? Especially in Asia. And that's why you call the United States a cornerstone balancer. Um, but to do that, we need to have credibility we need to get states to trust us that we'll contribute to their defense. We can't be the only one contributing, but that will we'll come to the fore. And you focus on Asia and you sort of draw out your examples in Asia using Asia as a case study. Uh, and that's when you get into your discussions with Taiwan. So 
I think that's a pretty accurate recap of, of the book. Hopefully <laughs> you agree. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I really liked it, but now just for the fun of it to, to sort of get into a discussion, I do have four points I wanna make four critiques um, in, in the spirit of, of drawing out uh, different ideas here. First, in a general sense, I think you have way too much faith in what, I, what I'll call the boundaries of war. So you have these wonderful phrases, focused boundaries, cabined strikes, which I, I haven't even said that word really ever. <laughs> so cabin strikes, meaning bounded strikes, um, tolerable boundaries. So our adversary is really going to abide, you know, is this wishful thinking? Where's friction, Clausewitz friction? Um, so I still, and, and those are important concepts in your book because they do hit, I mean, your argument is that we're not necessarily gonna end up in a total war. We want to avoid that, right? You spent a lot of time talking about how we need to avoid that, the danger is there. So I just, um, I'd like you to elaborate there a little bit. Um, second, I'll go through my points and then you can address the ones you want. You can conveniently forget the ones you don't want to address. So, so <laughs> second, um, I think that you discount, I mean, to, to Ken's point, other forms of power. Like, I, I completely agree that military power is the ultimate arbiter and un must undergird, um, undergird the, the, the political, diplomatic, the economic, and does, right? It's a key component. Uh, but there are other ways that China can, if not defeat us, really bring some of these coalition partners, uh, you know, uh, bring them to their knees in a way, cyber. I mean, a, 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 you know, a systematic cyber attack, unrelenting, sustained for a long time. Maybe you would call this part of military power, not sure, but I think there, there are um, sp specific ways that China could really make it hard to sustain the will of that coalition. And so I don't think that's really, maybe it's gray zone, maybe it's not. Um, I think also, I don't think you addressed kind of the, the TSMC scenario, which is the scenario in which China specifically um, takes over or takes out Taiwan's microchip facilities. They're not going to take it out, obviously not, because there's too much to lose there. But so there are these other, I think, very powerful ways of achieving outcomes uh, that they want. Um, third, and this is a bigger point, but by advocating for a strategy of denial, your book is very defense focused, and that's a good thing, right? But you don't really address what opportunities there are for us to positively shape development to achieve positive outcomes, to grow alliances? Or is this really just about preserving today's status quo ultimately? Because ultimately that's how I read it. And that's fine. That's kind of gonna be hard enough. <laughs> so, so it may be fine, but I, I, I'd like you to comment on that. And then fourth, this might be unfair because it's a hard one, but do you have confidence the DOD has the skills today to develop and implement anywhere near the kind of sophisticated strategy that you describe in the book, which requires nuance, which requires uh, you know, nuances of credibility, of understanding our limitations, of attention to political effects. These are all things that you talk about. And I have very little evidence that the Department of Defense as we know it today um, is, is, very, is very good at those things, unfortunately. We didn't see any of that in how the withdrawal from Afghanistan was conducted, for instance. Um, and, you know, related to this, you know, we'll lose in Asia if we lose in Asia, not so much in my view because of a minimal presence in the Middle East. So on this, I agree with Ken, but because of these kinds of problems of, of competency in, in many ways, uh, we have the sophisticated technology. We have a lot of sophisticated weapons and capabilities, um, but I'm worried in, in some sense for these other, other, re other reasons. So those are my comments and uh, hopefully you take them in, in good spirit. <laughs> Thanks. Absolutely. No, I'm, I'm delighted and, and honored by your engagement, Nadia. It's, I mean, as Bob Work says, differences among strategists, this, this, is, the, this is exactly the kind of engagement I, I hope to spur. I mean, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just kind of respond on your, on your points, uh, which are, I mean, I think very fair, uh, you know, pain points in the argument, if you will. Um, you know, limited war. I mean, I, 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 I say this, I'm, I'm always kind of haunted by the, the shadow of Vietnam, because a lot of the arguments that I make are associated with people who who I feel like were responsible for getting us into that quagmire. So I'm very acutely conscious of that. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, if you just think about it, right? Like if we live in a situation of, of mutual nuclear vulnerability, but 
states are building very large and exercising very large conventional warfare wars, uh, uh, militaries, and they care and they are, you know, apparently are willing to, you know, take risk under the nuclear shadow. So to me, that means that, you know, you could be right that a limited war is impossible, but states are certainly preparing as if they think it is possible, right? And I mean, if we in China, got, there's never been a major war between nuclear armed superpowers, right? But during the Cold War, there were a couple of things. One, the stakes were manifestly very, very high, you know, better dead than red. And secondly, there were nuclear weapons everywhere. I mean, even as late in the 1950s, US forces defending Taiwan could not operate without mass use of tactical nuclear weapons. That's not the case anymore. You could, first of all, I think people sense the stakes are lower, whether that's right or not, I think that's the general perception. And secondly, nuclear weapons are very recessed. I mean, I think plenty of war games happen, you know, that name your FFRDC conduct, which is a conventional war. <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, with China. So, I mean, you know, so if that's the case, so what are the boundaries of that war, right? I mean, if we're not going all out and, you know, and I think if you look back historically, wars are almost always limited. In fact, we have fought a limited war with China, the, the Korean War, where there were actually uh, implicit but, but observed boundaries. For instance, I don't think we conducted large scale attacks north of the Yalu River and the communists did not attack, uh, conduct significant attacks in the Sea of Japan. Those weren't written down anywhere. Obviously, in Vietnam, I think we hurt ourselves in that respect. But I mean, I think if if we're going to deter the Chinese, which is the goal, uh, and if necessary, defeat them, we have to think about how that war would be limited. And the best way to, to, to avoid it is to show the Chinese that we know exactly how we would approach it, we're adaptive, and we have the capabilities and concepts to deal with it. So that's that's the way I think about it. I mean, I think getting in a war with China would be a very bad option, but it might be less bad than the alternative. So that's the kind of way I think about the limited war stuff. Um, do I discount other forms of power? Yes, I think hard power is determinative. And I mean, hard power I define as economic power and then ultimately military power. I don't, I just don't see soft power driving a lot in the international environment. I think it's one of the, uh, I'll try to be polite. I, 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 it's, it's not helped us understand how things work to get back to Ken's point about parsimony. I mean, I think resolve matters and soft power can affect that resolve, but ultimately it'll be questions of, of the allocation of hard power. I mean, I think, I think if we're thinking in that way, and I, I, I think we've thought way too much about soft power and it confuses us because what we need, now, and I'm worried the Biden administration is doing that right now. And in fact, I mean, actually some of your point, I'm not making, obviously not making a political comparison, but I mean, Jake Sullivan, and Hal Brands wrote a piece kind of criticizing my line of argument about this in foreign policy a couple of years ago, saying, no, this is more of a technology and economic and ideological competition, not a military competition. I just, I think that's, I think that's incorrect, partially because our emphasis, I mean, President Biden said it yesterday in Michigan, in basically that. And it's like, we are actually potentially incentivizing the Chinese to use the military instrument more if we demonstrate vulnerability in the military domain. And I know that's not what you're saying, but like, yeah. No, I don't, because I don't mean soft, I mean, I didn't use the term soft oh. power. I okay, mean, like, I like a, a sustained cyber attack, are you including oh. that as a kinetic strike? I mean, like, like, okay, or yeah, a sustained, yeah, yeah. Ah. you know, taking over an economic, like a TSMC that would affect the entire yeah. continent, okay. global so economy. So I, I responded to a, a, yeah. another argument that isn't yours. Now I'll, now I'll respond to that one. <laughs> yeah, just, now yeah, I mean, I think that's equivalent to a bombing campaign. If you did a large scale cyber campaign, that would be an act of war, right? But I actually don't think it would be likely to work. I mean, our experience with bombing is pretty sorry. You know, I love the Air Force and everything, but like maybe Japan kind of worked, but it didn't really work in Germany. It didn't break their will, not in North Vietnam, not North Korea, not in Iraq, sort of in Kosovo context. I don't think the Chinese are gonna be able to use that to break the will because what's gonna happen is it's probably gonna trigger the resolve of people on Taiwan. And I think it's gonna elicit sympathy you know, in the way that the Blitz elicited sympathy, which I think the Chinese will see and they will anticipate that and they'll skip that because you skip that if you, because it's going to catalyze the coalition formation that you want to avoid. So that's, um, I, I just, you know, I, it's reductive because I think if I, you know, I try to think about this from like the Chinese perspective too. If I'm serious about it, I cut through all those stages and I go to the kill shot, if you will. Um, because I lose that option if I, if I, there, there's a, there's, and I'm not saying you are, but there's often a, a, a surmise or, or a presumption that China will sort of uh, boil the frog. Whereas like boiling the frog allows us to get our acts together. 
right? Like if you if you walk us up through gray zone and then you seize an island and then you put a blockade on, well, that gives us lots of time to get ready and to see that you're dangerous. Whereas their incentive is to move fast, cauter, cauterize it, you know? And that's what I'm more, more worried about. And that's part, again, part of the reason for the book is like, well, Rich, like what you're saying is kind of extreme, but then like, if you think about it from a ruthless jerk point of view, if you're Chinese, that I think is actually the best strategy and we need to get ahead of that. Um, positively shaped outcomes. You know, this is interesting. I think this was a, a I think this was actually a pushback I, that we got in the national defense strategy in a way. I mean, I regard at this, I think Clausewitz says something to this effect, but like if he didn't, he should have. Um, the, at, at the geopolitical level, defense is good. I mean, it's, it's it, it, military, I don't know, others would know better, but I, I generally think the defense probably has the advantage certainly on land, but, but, you know, it pays to not fire the first shot. It pays to be seen as the, the deterrer rather than the compeller, right? I mean, the aggrieved party. And I think we really want to array ourselves in that situation. And I'm not fixed. In fact, I think Chris Burroughs made a good point, which is like, maybe I'm too status quo in my thinking. And I've been cogitating about that. But the idea is not to hold on to everything that we have. I do think that there's a reason we drew our defense perimeter at the first island chain. 75 years ago, because we're good at naval and aerospace and high technology warfare, not land wars on the Asian mainland. And that's still true. So, but I think positively shaping outcomes is definitely consistent with the book. I just don't think it should be, you know, I tried to give like, here's what we really need to do in the world. And we need to make sure we get this right. Um, but then we can do stuff on top of that, that, that would make us better. Um, and then finally, do I have confidence in DOD? I mean, I'm really worried. I'm really worried, not because there aren't a lot of great people in the military, of course there are, but I don't see like the large scale urgency, like terror in people's eyes that I would want to make sure that people would have, you know, like, like the motivation to, to like, cause I mean, you know, if you listen to like Clint Hino from the air force, he's like, we lose every war game. And even worse, he's almost worse. He says, we know how to fix it, but that's not in the program force. It's like, so, and then you have like Admiral Studeman out at, you know, PACOM saying we may already be too late. And I'm thinking to myself and people are going along, you know, having hearings, you know, they're changing. And then you, and then you have the equating, you have the equating of, you know, threat climate and COVID yeah, with, right. with China, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Yeah, exactly. Like climate is not a strategic actor, right? Like, right. I mean, right. so I, and actually, the one quibble I would say is I don't think my strategy is that nuanced. I think, if anything, it's like simplistic. It's kind of like more for like mass mind of government. I'm trying to make it as simple and parsimonious as possible. So it's like, let me not be misunderstood. Like if I were actually <laughs> the, the decision maker, I might hedge a little bit here and there more than I see. But I, like, I just want to make it so sort of almost like luridly clear that the mass mind of government will... We'll grab with it because I, you know, I'm trying to avoid this. I mean, just where I see us going is to a train wreck, and I want to avoid it. But then you use these hard words like cabin. <laughs> just kidding. Ah, so I know, the cabin is not good, but I mean, I, it's that was that's what's some real. That's what some, that whole thing is so because it's like a multi-factor. I know. You know, I'm, like it's like well, you're an old, old friend. Know. I'm allowed to. I'm allowed to joke. With you. <laughs> no, I know. Thanks, Bridge. Oh. Thank you, Nadia. Mike. Well, first of all, I think you succeed in the task you set for yourself in this book. Uh, if I was gonna be effusive, I'd say you succeed brilliantly in the task you set out for yourself. And throughout the book, you repeat the task that this is a broad strategic framework for how to think about the issue. You're not gonna have programmatic, you know, nitty gritty, how many frigates and how many submarines should go where. Uh, and th this framework you're laying out is actually new. I consider myself something of a know-it-all about the US-China strategy. My age alone justifies that uh, arrogant position. But there's some new material in your book that I compliment you on. A lot of people have edged up to, to saying what you're talking about, especially in chapter 10. I'm going to read you some quotes from chapter 10. Uh, I remember a war game in 1994 where something very similar to one of your scenarios was happening is at the Naval War College 
Uh, Joe Sestak was the young captain uh, in charge and Admiral Blair was there as well. And we got pretty much to where you are in chapter 10 when the war game was officially terminated. And a lot of us, right? Is when they terminate. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of us made notes like we need to explore these issues more. So fast forward, and you do that in chapter ten. And let me be really specific because this is, I think, your book is not a, sort of a Henry Kissinger diplomacy balance of power. It's not a guide for how to talk about China in graduate school. It's a nitty gritty defense strategy book. And one of the things you say that's very vivid. Suppose we lose most of Taiwan, the PLA has consolidated to some degree its defense. Could US special forces and other US forces land on whatever's left and recapture Taiwan? And you lay that out almost as a whole chapter. That is a fascinating topic. Would our allies, would Japan come with us? Would we, able to, would we be able to do it? Do we have the supplies on hand and for those who think they can be, you know, pessimistic hawks, you cut them off. You say, you give some examples where actually three or four years was required to do this. So you're changing, but to me is the conventional wisdom that is wrong. The Taiwan thing will be over in a week. You know, we'll sink some of theirs, they'll sink some of ours. Uh, sometimes President Trump uh, talked this way. You're saying, no, if, if force is used, We'll be lucky if Taiwan has a graceful declining uh, front line, as it were, and there's something left that we can recapture. Now, I'm, I'm, uh, I could read many, many quotations to you from this chapter, but this is fresh and new, and it's not for students of foreign policy or grand strategy. It's a defense discussion you're having, and very few people are, uh, I think, equipped to be able to either defend against it or more importantly, to keep tabs, are we making progress on dealing better with Bridge Colby's main scenario? And you provide a number of clues for how we could measure how well we're doing in the future. This wonderful adjective, th thumatic, <laughs> that we hope, or I hate to put it that way, but it would be best for us and for the coalition if the Chinese attack, or you use the word ugly, were very ugly, ruthless. Uh, I hate to even add more example, more adjectives. That this way, the coalition is spurred like Pearl Harbor did to the Americans. And the Chinese, who I know so well, they're going to translate your book, Bridge, if they haven't already. In my case, they had a ceremony for me in Beijing. <laughs> two, two PLA generals handed me a copy of the Hundred Year Marathon showed me how it was classified because the Chinese people are not ready for this. They'll do this with you. And they're gonna look at that particular scenario. Can you Americans exploit our ugly, thematic, passionate attack in order to build a coalition? And the Chinese are gonna say, no, will not be that easy for you. We're gonna stage it so that Taiwan is to blame. Right now this week, imagine if one of these uh, bombers or fighters in the air defense identification zone. Imagine if Taiwan shoots one down. If China then takes escalation steps. Who started it? Taiwan started it. This is China's best strategy, not to play into Bridge Colby's hands, but to get Taiwan to share at least half the blame, if not more. That's what I worry about. But you're, to your great credit, you forced anybody who gets to chapter 10, and I hope it's all of your readers, especially students in graduate school, I hope they'll get to chapter 10 and go, my God, we're facing a really serious war with the Chinese if what? If we get things wrong in the near term. And just to give you an example, you mentioned uh, cutting off the PLA maritime forces as they're coming to Taiwan. I remember a debate in the Pentagon 2002 Let's not sell Apache helicopters to Taiwan with Hellfire missiles, which Taiwan said we need to go out in the strait and sink the landing ships. <laughs> and this would be offensive, therefore it's not qualified. Eventually it was overruled and we sold the Apaches with the Hellfires to Taiwan. But this kind of short-term decisions happening all the time now where we, de we deny things Taiwan either needs or we ourselves 
don't make preparations for the kind of war scenario you're talking about. So my only question is, have I understood your argument uh, very well? Uh, or should I say, no, I withdraw all my praise because I misunderstood your argument? <laughs> well, you've had to complete with that. I mean, uh, as somebody said, and those who say they're above, you know, some flattery I clearly never experienced it. I heard that. <laughs> That's really true for me. No, Mike, it, it, it means a great deal. I mean, you're a, really a giant in this area. And, uh, uh, you know, to paraphrase General Gall, you, you have understood me. I mean, I think actually, if I could say chapter 10, the binding strategy, I think is probably the if there is some novelty in the mm. book, it is there. Uh, and you know, I think other parts. I hope my service to have been to brought together uh, strands and, and, and issues in a, in a mm. coherent and parsimonious way. But a lot of it is, is stuff that, that should be familiar territory. Maybe maybe a novel spin or something. But the binding strategy, I think, and I think you, I agree with you. I think that is where we're potentially heading, because mm. um, I mean. You know, I, I think I begin the chapter by kind of saying, well, we might fail to mount mm -hmm. a, a, an effective focused denial defense. That's where we're heading right now, is that we are not going to be able to do that and China will win. That's what the Taiwan defense minister said yesterday. Or China will be so powerful that we will have to wage a much larger war. And if current trends continue, that will also be the case. So we have to think about this broader war. And this gets back to Nadia's point about DOD. I mean, this is where... I really think that because the military strategy, we have to get it right. You know, it's like cops in a neighborhood. You can't worry about a commercial opportunity if you don't get the law and order piece right. We have to get this right. And everybody has to be involved because it, you know, in a sense, it's about military power. But how much military power is allocated to a contest is dependent upon resolve, which itself is, in a sense, a story. I mean, that's where the Thumos comes in to, to, to can our discussion earlier. And I mean, I use examples too much for American history. That's you know my own poverty of, 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 of knowledge. But you know, I mean, Lincoln maneuvering this, the, the rebels into firing first at Fort Sumter, which was against the recommendation mm. of, of the army, you know, which wanted to withdraw from an indefensible position. But you know, 75,000 Northerners volunteered for the federal army after that. Or, you know, I mean, who knows what the truth is, but there is a story that it was the Sons of Liberty who fired first at, mm -hmm. at Lexington Green, you know, to you make, you make both these points in the book, by the way. Yes, no, sorry to repeat myself, but I think they're, <laughs> I've got a few and they're good, you know, but <laughs> I should get some better ones. But I mean, I think the idea there being that, you know, that led to the, the, the uprising and sympathy throughout the colonies and so forth. And so this is where I really think the, the conversation needs to go. And I'm very concerned that we're not prepared to have it because there's comfort, you know, Mike, as you suggest, in the sort of let's talk about hellfires and, and the ships in the strait, and we need to get that right. But that's not the end of the problem. You know, if I mean, I, I love the Achmanic criteria. If we can get 350 PLAN ships in the first mm -hmm. 72 hours, we'll be in better <laughs> shape than the alternative. But we also have to think about how do we, in a sense, and, and you're right, I, I struggled with this problem. It's not that we're forcing China to have to do this. We're forcing China to sit on the horns of a dilemma. If it wants to pursue regional dominance, it will have to behave in a way that is so manifestly aggressive, it will catalyze the coalition. And I only scratch the surface in the book about what that means. I hope that's an area where, frankly, a lot of gaming would be really helpful, a lot more analysis. I mean, younger people, if they're thinking about this, and our regional partners. Um, but I mean, I, to your point about the Chinese reading it, I, I have tremendous respect for the Chinese. That's why I'm so worried. I imagine they are already thinking about this, you know, and if they can get, if they can confuse the issue about Taiwan, even that could have an enormous outsized effect. You know, I mean, one of the, one of the things that, that, uh, you know, Clausewitz, you can tell a lot by who somebody quotes a lot, but like, you know, Clausewitz says, you know, everybody knows war is the continuation by politics by other means, but my, his actual line is something like, Every military operation has to have the political objective in its conception. It doesn't mean that you limit. You might actually may become more violent, but it's just that the political, the military action should lead to a political outcome that itself will develop more military capacity mm -hmm. because the resolve is catalyzed. So, so I, I think that's where we're heading, but I'm quite worried. And when I see some things out of the Pentagon, like, oh, we should you know, withdraw the second island chain and, and just do long range strike. I think to myself, these people are not grappling with the reality that we have to be in coalition and our military strategy has to be catalyzing that coalition. Otherwise, it's not clear what we're even fighting about. 
So anyway, I, I'm, I'm really glad that you that you hooked onto the buying strategy because that's one of the points I'm, I'm excited. I hope people pick up on. If, if, if I can, Mike, are you done? No, I wanted to mention the idea in the future and I'd be happy to be your co-author if you want. We can try to rope Nadia in too. Yeah. Uh, we need to f follow this carefully with a kind of a checklist of how is DOD doing? Mm -hmm. I think you mentioned that you and Eli Ratner both testified to the Senate Armed Services mm -hmm. Committee several years ago. Yeah. And you both said that this committee should take on this issue and keep track of how DOD is doing. I don't think <laughs> the Senate Armed Services Committee took your advice, but at Hudson, we have a lot of photos up on the wall of, of Herman Kahn. He's like our founding saint. Of course. And think about. thinking about the unthinkable and the escalation steps, all of that ought to be a topic of a lot of us from now on, now that you've done this book, we can ask ourselves, do we have the number of cruise missiles that would be needed? Do we have special forces who speak Mandarin? How would we do this recapture scenario? What do the Japanese and Indians and others do as part of this, with their help or hurt? So this is a checklist that could be worked on for quite some time. And everybody will have to buy a copy of the book, which will be good for book sales. <laughs> Not against that. <laughs> and now from what I'm saying, they know they only have to read chapter 10. <laughs> I even put a plan of the book at the beginning, a short summary for the truly attention challenge. You, you have to that. read the chapter one too, I think, to be fair. But. <laughs> Thank you. One of the interesting things about uh, chapter 10 is this, this is the discussion of the recapture strategy. And Mike and I were chatting about this beforehand, and, and particularly the role of the Japanese. You, you have obviously been a, a lead critic of, uh, I don't think any former Pentagon official has been a bigger critic of uh, Japanese uh, defense spending uh, and Japanese preparedness than you have been. You've been very vocal in the Nikkei and elsewhere. Yet you present the scenario where the Japanese are engaged in this recapture scenario as part of the binding coalition. How, um, how realistic is that, is that scenario? Well, I think, well, if we're in a recapture scenario, we're in trouble. And, and forget us, Japan is in real trouble. I mean, I think, as I've said to you, and I thank you for that, I wear that moniker with pride because I think that the Japan Alliance is the most important in the world. And I don't just say that because I grew up there. I think it's just an objective reality. And the Japanese are way behind where they need to be. They're finally starting to say the right things, but that's, they're about 10 or 15 years behind where they need to be. And, you know, partly I'm so worried about this because, you know, if you, again, if you think the Chinese are smart, which I do, and they decide to pull the trigger on Taiwan, I don't think you then wait and allow the anti-hegemonic coalition to register what just happened and, and react by balancing. So, you know, in, the, in those circumstances, of course, there would be more political opportunity to do a defense build up in Japan. But if you're China, why would you allow that to happen? So instead, if I were Beijing, after I moved on to Taiwan, I would actually not wait. And, and I'm not saying that I would immediately use military force against Japan, but I might, you know, I, I would have a lot of credibility at that point because I would be very fearsome. And I would say to Japan, if you initiate a military buildup and align more with the United States, we will regard that as a hostile act. And I would have a lot of options as Beijing to how to do that. So actually Japan might, there's, I, I think there's a presumption in a lot of Japanese minds that, okay, first Taiwan will fall. And then we'll, you know, if that happens, we'll be able to, but I don't think that's necessarily true because that would be foolish. And I don't think the Chinese are foolish. So, I mean, I think, um, you know, and essentially, the island of Taiwan, Formosa, is part of the Japanese archipelago, broadly construed. So if it falls, I mean, forget the Senkakus. The Senkakus are toast if Taiwan falls, right? And I don't think we should offer to defend them. I mean, it's, we can't offer things that are foolish. So, I mean, we will be in a really bad way. And I, and I, I you know, I, one of the things that I'm saying, I mean, the positive outcome, Nadia, point is, I'm, I guess I'm trying a theory of direct, but hopefully polite candor with our allies that I think we've been too reassuring as a country. And, and, you know, I don't like it when the president says that our commitments are sacred. I mean, our commitments are, I mean, God is sacred. You know, the family is sacred. Alliances are more like business partnerships. If they become unsustainable and irrational, we have to readjust, you know? And if we say they're sacred, then we induce the very behavior we're trying to counteract. And so, you know, that's what I'm trying to trying to deal with. And I, and I really do hope the Japanese engage with this book. And I think the Japanese strategically actually in doing the national defense strategy 
no government was more aligned with us than Japan. But the, the political, they haven't moved the politics. And is it realistic? I guess the basic point I would say there, Ken, is I think things are going to become realistic soon that will boggle our minds. So we need, like war. So we need to act as if that's already a possibility and front load it so we avoid the outcome. Thank you. We are down to about three minutes. Nadia, Mike, if you have any final comments or questions. And there is one, there is one scary thing about the book, Bridge, that I hope you can reassure me, but I'm not, <laughs> I'm not leading the witness. <laughs> uh, you you try to you, you point out that we shouldn't be making commitments and guarantees all over the place, and then you go through country by country. And to put it in a negative way, it's like who we should sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't put it that way. You say who we should not make a guarantee to. And imagine that you're reading your, that you're reading your book in Cambodia, where you write them off. Okay, Myanmar, you say they're the real estate that goes to the Indian Ocean, but you kind of write them off. Then you say, India, well, they're really important. We should encourage them, but we shouldn't be allies, and they won't be allies anyway. So you have this list and Thailand, you say, well, it was a thin commitment anyway. So let's not tell the Thais that we're gonna guarantee their sovereignty either. So I don't know when you get over to the Middle East, whether Israel is on this list or, or Iraq, but you, it's kind of scary how ruthless you are saying, look, we gotta focus on the main issue, denying China hegemony in the world, because it will put us back I don't know what, a hundred years. So it sounds like you keep some countries that have treaties with us, that they're okay. But this other group, don't we need those partners to have some sense of a guarantee, perhaps without a formal treaty guarantee? Well, Especially I, given your differentiated credibility, yeah. right? Where it's hard yeah. to do to Michael's point. Well, I mean, not to be maudlin, but I would say I'm I'm thinking about the interests of the American people. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I don't want to sound trite, but like I'm really thinking about what what should they be prepared to to sacrifice in large numbers for? And so that's how I'm thinking about it. I think the balance of power in Asia is, is critical for them. And I don't think, especially given how demanding that's going to be, I don't think we can afford peripheral commitments. I mean, I think in the Middle East, the good thing is the countries there are often willing to do a lot. I mean, the Israelis are a great example. They, I mean, I think we should empower them as, as much as possible and work with them as much as possible, but they actually don't want us. They're actually like the Indians and to some extent the Vietnamese and the Finns. They kind of want to pull their own weight. That's two thumbs up, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, I think we need to change our mindset toward the Gulf states where they carry a lot of their own weight a lot more their own weight. And they basically, you know, we're there in extremists potentially along with maybe like the French and the British and others. Um, but they really, you know, for instance, we're not going to defend them against every missile strike, honestly. They need to, I don't know, hire more contractors or we can sell them patriots or whatever, but that's not something that, that we should be doing ourselves. And I think, you know, look, NATO is in jeopardy going forward. I mean, if we, if, I mean, I think we are now in a situation where we already have a one major war force. We don't have a simultaneous force. And on my view is if Russia attacked first, we should still withhold for Asia. We don't have enough capacity in the mm -hmm. force to do both and we shouldn't expose ourselves. And I think it's, I, wrote, I actually wrote an article that translated into German and I make this point in the German, serious, it's the German defense journal. They don't have as many as they used to, um, but I think this may be the only one. But, uh, but you know, it's saying like, look, this is the reality. And I think the way to save NATO, I think, is to deal with that reality. Um, and I think we should be ruthless because I think we should be ruthless because the American people deserve it. You know, that's what I'm thinking about. And I want to, I want to, I want to stay offshore if I can, because I don't want to get in a land war in Asia uh, if I can avoid it, if we can avoid it. So I want to work with it. And then I think the question, the push comes to shove, will come in Southeast Asia, because it's. It's kind of unincorporated in one camp mm -hmm. or the other. Um, and if we let China run rampant, it will be a big problem because there are a lot of wealth and population and latent military power there. But I Ken's would rather gonna, avoid it. Ken, Ken is going to cut us off, Bridge, but I yes. wanted to mention when I was in Taiwan learning Chinese yeah. in the early 70s for two years, it's now been declassified. There were more than 20 US nuclear weapons there. They were on quick reaction alert against yeah. the mainland. Yep. So if you want to if you want to scare people, just say I think we need to return nuclear weapons to Taiwan. 
that'll create a whole new debate uh, on its own. Well, I think we should be prepared to escalate uh, where it's most advantageous to us, and we should rethink all the all the shibboleths of the past. Sorry, Chaz Freeman. <laughs> but that's that is the perfect way to end the discussion. It's been a superb uh, discussion. I really want to thank. Uh, uh, my Hudson Institute colleagues, uh, senior fellows Nadia Shadlow and Mike Pillsbury, and uh, Bridge Colby for uh, this uh, superb book, The Strategy of Denial, American Defense in an Era of Great Power Competition. I want to thank everyone. Go out and buy the book, read it, agree, disagree, and thank you for the spirit of uh, in which you took the uh, the discussion, Bridge. And uh, this thank is fantastic. All of you. Thank you, thank you all. Really appreciate it. I'm honored and uh, great, great conversation. Thank you. Thank you.